Hey folks, in this video, I'm going to be going over another game submitted to our Patreon page. And in this game, we're going to be discussing the Scotch opening, uh, which is a really, really popular opening, especially at lower levels. And um, this game here submitted by CJang playing black uh, really shows kind of the typical experience someone often has when they first play against uh, the Scotch. Now, um, I don't think this was CJang's actual first game against uh, the Scotch because they've been playing for a little while. Um, but what we see in the opening after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, white goes d4. This is known as the, the Scotch opening where white fights for the center right from the get-go. Black takes on d4, knight takes d4, uh, and then plays knight takes d4. And that's why I want to call this game everyone's first game against uh, the Scotch, because I remember when I was playing this opening um, from both colors when I was a kid, uh, lots of games would go this way. Why would play d4? Black would take this pawn, which I think is a good move. And then after knight takes d4, black would hurry up and just trade on d4 and bring white's queen in. Um, into the game. I remember I would do this one with black and then when I was playing white people would often do this against me. And the truth is that it's simply not very good to exchange on d4 here uh, two times for black especially trading the knights because here white's queen on d4 is actually quite a strong piece. It's very nicely active and centralized and black doesn't have such a great way to kick this queen around. We don't have a second knight to jump to c6, which is why when white plays, for example, d4 on move two, this one is considered to be not so great. I think the scotch is a perfectly fine opening, but this one after e takes d4, queen takes d4, um, seems very similar, but here black gets extra time to develop the knight to c6 with tempo, and it already makes this not worth it for white because white is just losing a lot of time out of the opening. So once the knights are developed and white pushes d4, here I think black should go ahead and take on d4. A lot of players uh, resort to this move d6, but this is quite passive and black is worse here, either after bishop to b5 and you have to deal with this pin, or after d5 uh, immediately white can just take this space and uh, get a small advantage. So taking once on d4 is correct, and now after knight takes d4, it's better to just leave this tension, to leave our knight on c6 and not take on d4, which allows white to get the queen in. So there are many moves here for black, I think knight f6 is a perfectly solid move, and then if white defends the pawn with knight to c3, black can develop this bishop to b4 and pin the knight, get ready to castle, eventually fight for the center with d6 or d5, and I think black has an excellent game here. Uh, another very decent move is to play bishop to c5, just developing the bishop first, attacking the knight. Here, black often develops the queen to f6 to put even more pressure on this knight, and then the other knight can jump out to e7 and get developed this way. Again, black tries to castle kingside and has uh, a very decent game. But knight takes d4 is, of course, very natural, and the problem is um, there's just no way to challenge this queen, and black actually doesn't really have a great way to develop comfortably, because then the move knight f6 gets met with e5, and this knight simply doesn't have a great square to jump to. Any kind of queen e7 move can be met with bishop to e2, so the pawn is temporarily pinned, but after bishop e2, uh, the knight still is going to have to probably drop back to g8, and black loses a ton of time, and development now is totally messed up. So it's not so easy for black to actually get a comfortable position here. I think at this point, the best move might be something like queen to f6, hoping to trade queens. Uh, then if e5, black can swing around this way and play queen to b6, and then slowly try to develop, although white here I think is still better. White can also play something like bishop e3, and just prepare to recapture on d4 with the bishop, and have a small advantage in the endgame. Nothing uh, too serious, of course, it's not like black has just lost here, but already black has to um, come up with some good defensive moves to get their pieces out. Uh, in the game, we see black playing c5, which is again a very natural move once someone reaches this position. But unfortunately for black, not a very good move. And yeah, I had quite a few games when I was playing the scotch as a kid uh, that would reach exactly this position. Black would take on d4, I would happily recapture, and then black would play c5 which seems like it gets a tempo on the queen, but the difference between a move like c5 and a move like knight to c6 is that c5 doesn't actually develop any pieces for black. It's just a one move attack, it hits the queen, the queen will move away, and then the question is whether black really wants to have this pawn here on c5. Uh, and I think the answer is not really. Not only does the pawn block the bishop, more importantly, 
black has now given up a lot of squares here on the D file, especially the D5 square and also the D6 square, both have become really, really weak because black advanced their pawn. But especially this D5 square, the knight can jump in with knight C3 to knight D5 very quickly, and white has this fantastic outpost already available for their pieces. And white's pieces are in good position to take advantage. Bishop C4, knight C3, these pieces are well in position to take control over this square. Um, so a very difficult situation for black already. Black plays knight f6, uh, white goes knight to c3, and now white is starting to push e5, and again this knight doesn't have a great square to jump to. e5 could have been played here, but then at least black can uh, maybe consider knight to e4, although that looks uh, quite scary, um, but I, I like knight c3. Um, and now e5 is a problem. Sijang writes in the notes um, that they were considering uh, d6, but didn't like the outpost on, on d5, but the thing is that the outpost is already there. The outpost was created with this move c5. Now at this point, I think black needs to just develop d6, bishop e7, and castle, and hope for the best. Um, white is definitely better after something like bishop g5 or bishop b5 check first, basically just pinning this knight and fighting for this d5 square. Um, but yeah, black can just hope to survive and uh, solidly. If black can just you know develop their pieces and white doesn't get anything special, then Black can actually reach, I think, a, a normal game here, though um, it'll be up to white to see how, how they proceed um, from here. Um, in the game, we see queen to a5, which creates a threat of knight takes e4, but again, it's one of those threats that's very easy to deal with, and then there's a question of whether the queen is really that great on a5. Um, white plays bishop d3, I think this is totally fine. Bishop d2 was also a very reasonable move, just immediately breaking the pin and uh, setting the bishop's sights on the queen, and now black would have to worry about all kinds of discovered attack ideas with a move like knight d5 and so on. And so we get bishop d3, which I think makes sense. Uh, black plays bishop to d6, and okay, this move does block the d-pawn, which blocks the bishop on c8, but I actually don't think it's that bad if black can get the bishop to e5, get the pawn to d6, and develop the bishop, or if the, this bishop can be developed uh, via b7. Unfortunately, we never quite get there after castles, castles. White plays bishop c4, uh, which is a very nice move, improving the bishop and opening up an attack on the bishop on d6. And unfortunately for black, black goes rook e8 here. Uh, though, so the surprising thing is that white doesn't actually uh, capitalize on the blunder, even though the bishop is hanging. White plays bishop g5, black drops back queen d8, and now white does take the bishop on d6 and takes advantage of this mistake. Um, so what can I say uh, on this one? Obviously, keeping our pieces alive and healthy is very, very important. And one of the most um, crucial skills that a chess player can develop is board vision, just having a sense of what's going on on the board, what is under attack, what is hanging, what is defended. Basically, whenever any move is made, a chess player needs to be aware of what are the captures that are now possible, which pieces are now under attack, simply have to be very aware of these things. It's a very important part of becoming a good chess player. I think most players do struggle with this from time to time. Uh, every good chess player has hung you know, hundreds and thousands of pieces in, in their lifetime. It's all a matter of just getting practice and slowly getting uh, better and better at, well, not <laughs> dropping our pieces, keeping our pieces defended and watching out for when the opponent has um, direct attacks. So my advice here when we're playing chess, and this is another reason why playing long time controls is generally advisable for improvement compared to shorter time controls, is because when you play longer time controls, and this was a classical game, but um, I think this was somewhere in the, uh, I wanna say 30 to uh, 45 minute range, I'm not 100% sure. Um, when we play longer time controls, we get more time to really take care and make sure that the moves we're making are not blunders, to really pay attention to what the opponent is doing. And it gives you time after every move, and this is what chess players do, after every single move is played, they immediately scan the position, they try to understand, are there any new captures? Are there any threats from the opponent? And if you get into the habit of always looking for your opponent's threats, then over time it does become easier and easier to notice oops when the piece is under attack so yeah if black had just played bishop e5 in this position i think it's still a very playable game and uh, despite the opening not going our way black has prospects here for uh, a good situation can push d6 get the bishop out and again the game might improve 
Uh, unfortunately, we do end up blundering the bishop on uh, d6, and here things are basically over. Uh, queen e7, uh, C. Jang writes in, in their notes that yeah, trading queens, uh, they already understand, is not good when we're down material, but at this point, okay, the position is really tough, so it's hard to suggest other moves. White decides to trade, uh, goes bishop takes f6, and now kind of a funny moment, black just uh, drops back rook to e8 and doesn't recapture uh, the bishop. In the notes, C. Jang writes that uh, they <laughs> don't want to double their pawns after g takes f6, and it's kind of a funny mistake because I've seen uh, many beginner novice uh, level players make these uh, similar kind of errors in, in judgment. You know, you always hear these things, oh, double pawns are, are not good and you should avoid them. But material is more important than the structure. So we definitely need, uh, you know, it's more to be down an extra piece than to have double pawns in front of the king. So definitely, yeah, black has to 100% take care. I mean, the material is just worth so much more than uh, these double pawns being weak in, in front of the king. And here, black's king is not even actually that weak because we are in an endgame. Material has been reduced. White doesn't have an, you know, any huge army of pieces coming to the king side. Black can play king to g7 here. Now I understand it's not a nice position after knight to d5. White is still doing really, really well here. Um, but yeah, black for sure needed to take this piece. Then we're only down one piece and you know, game continues. We can still uh, hope for the best. So kind of an error in evaluation here, but hopefully that um, clears things up. Because uh, Si Jang is not the first person uh, or not the first player that I've seen to avoid capturing material in this way because they were worried about the double pawns. It is a thing that comes up a lot, and hopefully uh, this uh, clarifies that for you. So rookie eight, bishop h4, and now white is just up two pieces and has a pretty smooth time converting it. Although there's one more interesting moment in the game. Um, we end up getting some more trades. Rook takes e4, knight d6. And then something very odd happens here. Black goes rook to e2. Uh, white plays rook f2. Black gives rook e1 check. White goes rook f1. Black goes rook e2 again, trying to repeat the position because, of course, black is down two pieces. A draw would be an amazing result. And now white goes rook f2, also repeating. <laughs> And then black gives rook e1 check, rook f1, and repeats a third time. So now the position uh, could have been claimed uh, as a draw. And um, instead, white finally uh, changes their mind and plays knight f5 and ends up winning the game uh, very easily. Um, but the weird thing is actually that the position was repeated three times. I'll show it again in case uh, it wasn't clear. So in this original position, black played rook to e2, so this was the first time. Then rook f2, rook e1 check, rook e2. This was the second time this position has been repeated. And then rook f2, rook e1 check was played again, rook f1. And now on rook e2, this was the third time this exact position was repeated. Uh, and so anyone that's confused about the three time repetition rule, basically it's pretty simple. If a position is repeated three times, it has to be the exact same position with the exact same characteristics. Uh, meaning, for instance, if in one position you're allowed to castle and then two moves later you have the same pieces on the board but you're no longer allowed to castle, that's not the same exact position, right? If you moved your rook back and forth and lost your castling right, that's going to count as a different position. But here, okay, both kings have already castled long ago. The position gets repeated three times. It doesn't have to be a move-by-move -move repetition, meaning the, the pieces don't have to move to the same squares. So, for example, if black had played let's say rook e2, rook f2, and then black played rook e6, and white played like this, and then rook e2, and white played here, and then black played rook e3, and then white played, let's say, rook f5, and then rook e, uh, rook e1 check, rook f1, and then rook e2. Even though the rooks moved to different squares, this would still count as a three-time repetition because this exact position has now been reached three times. So now it becomes a, a question of how to actually like claim the draw. It used to be the case that you had to click draw, like as if you're offering a draw to your opponent, whether you're playing on chess.com or Lee Chess. And then um, once the position gets reached the third time, the server just grants the draw. Uh, nowadays, when I play on chess.com, I believe the game will just end automatically. So the server will just pick up if a position has been repeated three times and it'll just automatically claim a draw. 
Um, but this game was played on Lee Chess. I don't exactly know how it works over there, but if the position has been repeated three times, you might have to claim a draw yourself. Again, I don't know how it works with all the different sites. Um, if you're playing in an over the board game, like in a over the board tournament, and you wanna claim a draw, generally you have to do it uh, before you make your third move. So in this position um, here, before black makes the third repetition of rookie two, in an over the board tournament, you would pause the clock, get the tournament director, and, and you would tell them, I'm about to make this move rookie two, I'm claiming a three time repetition, this position has been reached three times, and then either your opponent would agree, and you can uh, agree to a draw right there, or if your opponent disagrees, the tournament director will like look through your score sheet and confirm that the position has been reached three times um, or, or not. Um, so it's a little bit tricky when you're doing it in person, but it's a very important rule to understand because when you are defending a worse position, if your opponent messes up and allows you to repeat three times and you can get a draw that way, I mean, that's totally legitimate. And that, that happens all the time in, in high level games. You know, the game drags out a really long time. A player allows a repetition, not realizing they're actually repeating the position because it happened in different uh, in different chunks of the game, right? Like five moves pass, five moves pass, and then the position all of a sudden gets repeated. So it does happen. And so you, as a defender, that's one of the things that you're trying to play for, right? We're also trying to trade off all the pawns when we're defending to leave our opponent without enough material to uh, to checkmate. We're also playing sometimes for the 50 move roll, right? Preventing the opponent from making progress. So looking for these threefold repetitions is of course very important. I don't think it's such a big deal in this game because White definitely did not have to allow the repetition. White should have just, you know, kept the game going, played any move like Rook to C1 or Knight F5, you know, just using the pieces and White would win easily. So I don't think it's such a tragedy that we missed out on the draw here. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to bring this up because I'm sure there are other players that are maybe struggling with this role and maybe aren't uh, too aware of how the rule actually uh, works. And if that's you, if you're confused by it, um, I would definitely recommend looking up the rule book to further uh, clarify if you're not sure exactly how it works. Um, all right, so as it happened in the game, eventually white did avoid the perpetual with knight to f5 and actually ends up with a nice mate after knight e7 check. Black could have defended better and not allowed the mate, of course, but at this point, yeah, the game was definitely uh, winning for white. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. So hopefully you found it useful. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And uh, yeah, if you're enjoying these game analysis videos, please do let me know in the comment section down below. All right, hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll catch you next time. Take care.